Oh, come in. Come in, nice to see you. You, you find me at my desk. I, uh, sort of opening post and things, but I've had the most wonderful, wonderful uh, gift in the post. And it's a book uh, which is amazingly precious to me. It's a, a first edition. You can't quite read it there, but it's The Chimneys at Green No, or Chimneys of Green No. That's a wonderful illustration of the children climbing up the chimneys. And it's by Lucy Boston, who's a, a favourite author of mine and um, a wonderful children's author. Um, but there's a very special story to this book, a kind of double connection, and it comes with the most moving letter. So um, this is the first book in the series, the one I first read, The Children of Green No. You see, it's published by Faber, who published T.S. Eliot. I mean, she's a very fine writer. Um, so I tell you what, uh, why don't you come and sit down again and I'll show you both books and tell you a bit about why, why they're so special. Ah, right, so um, I was quite a little boy when, and in Africa, when I first uh, read these books. There's a whole series of them by Lucy Boston and this is the first one, The Children of Green Know. The wonderful. They're illustrated with these wonderful dark woodcuts by Peter Boston, Lucy's son. This is the little boy, the hero, Tolly, arriving at the house of Green No, which has got a great river going by it, and it's it's in it's in flat, flooded, flat country, and he arrives on a dark, rainy night and has to go the last bit by boat. Anyway, I was was wonderfully moved by these stories, and then an extraordinary thing happened. Um, I, when I became a school teacher, I, um, I was teaching in a place called St Ives, not the one in Cornwall, but near Huntingdon. And I decided to use this book uh, to read with my first form, because quite young children could read it, to read with my 11 year olds. And I was mentioning it to the, uh, one of the other English teachers, and he said, oh, why don't you pop round? You could go and visit Green now. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather. It's as though he'd said you could go and visit Narnia. Green Noah and Narnia were part of the same sort of mysterious, magical realms where remarkable <coughs> things happened. Magical things to do with the house. Because there's a magic in the house that the children and the little old lady, the grandmother, but especially the children and the animals, are all somehow aware of all the memories of the house. Or well, that is to say, the children who've lived in the house in different periods of its history, because it is the oldest inhabit, continuously inhabited house in England, they can play with each other. It's not like ghosts coming, it's just that they move in and out of each other's times through the kind of continuity of the house. Anyway, it turned out that um, Lucy Boston was just like Mrs. Old knowing the stories and that there was a house and it really was the oldest inhabited house in England and it was not far from the school where I was teaching. So this other teacher who knew Lucy said he'd make me an introduction and one, as it happened, dark rainy night, just like the one that Tolly um, visited, the hero little boy, Lucy, visited Mrs. Old now in, um, I showed up and there she was, looking just like the house looked exactly as it did in the pictures because, of course, her son had drawn it. And she welcomed me in and I was utterly enchanted and we got to know each other. And um, it was just beautiful. It was just the most magical thing. And in fact, she turned out also wrote poetry and um, she actually asked me if I'd like to move into the house and become her amanuensis. But I, I wasn't able to do that. I just, I just got engaged and Maggie and I were about to be married. But Maggie came out to the house too and... Um, and it was just towards the very end of her life. She was in her 90s then, but she um, had such bright young eyes and was so full of stories and did this wonderful quilting. Anyway, so that was... Well, one day in my church times column, Poets' Corner, I decided to write about that encounter and I wrote a little story about it and uh, described how I'd been to see her. And then a little while later, I, uh, I received this book the Chimneys of Green No, in a little package. And now the children of Green No, uh, the, the Chimneys of Green No is really interesting. It's set in the late 18th century, or it's set in modern times, and then the, the hero, Tolly, gets to know two children who lived in the house in the 18th century. 
and they're very interesting as a pair of children. Um, the, they're the real heroes of the story and one is a girl called Susan who's blind and the other is a little boy called Jacob who is uh, um, an African child who's been brought over having been bought as a slave but really to rescue him in Jamaica by Captain Old No. And um, in a sense, I mean this book was written in the 1950s, it's amazing in advance, they're the two most marginalised figures in their society, the disabled girl and the little black boy. And it's horrible that the way that some of the grown-ups in that world are really prejudiced against them both for those different reasons of ethnicity and disability. But of course they are the heroes and in fact we see that how brilliant, how clever, how imaginative they both are in their different ways when everybody else is dismissing them as ignorant and talking about them as if they weren't there when they're already there in the room. Um, anyway, the portrayal of the of the blind girl is, is particularly sympathetic. She's not at all uh, disabled in the story. She has all kinds of abilities that the sighted people don't. Uh, anyway, I'd always noticed when I had the book in paperback that it was dedicated to um, four girls, to Jennifer, Helen, Mary and Dorothy. And uh, then I got this letter. And it turned out to be a letter from one of those four girls mentioned in the dedication who uh, had an older reader because she was she's a blind person herself but had, had read to her the little column I wrote. And she said, she may be, you may be interested to know that three friends and I had a tiny part in one of these books. You will remember, I'm sure, that in the chimneys of Green Nay, one of the central characters, Susan, a girl who is completely blind. I myself also have no sight. And in the 1950s, I was a pupil at Chorleywood College, a grammar school for girls with little or no sight. Lucy Boston obviously wanted to make her story as realistic as possible, so she visited our school and spent an afternoon with four of us. I wish I could remember more of what we said and did on that day, but I'm sure she would have asked lots of questions and watched how we reacted with one another. Susan, with Jacob's encouragement, becomes a doughty tree climber. In the grounds of our school there was a weeping beech tree, and when we were in our younger years we used to climb up into that tree and sit and sing in the branches. I wonder whether we gave a demonstration to Lucy Boston on the day of her visit. Well, I'm sure they did because it's um, so it's an astonishing um, thing that I now have this book. And if you look, in fact, on that dedication page, it says, "With thanks for your help in getting this written, yours very sincerely, Lucy M. Boston." <coughs> and there's another reason for being particularly glad to have this original hardback because as you'll see this is a later paperback reprint and these are such classics that Faber decided to do a series called Faber Children's Classics and they reprinted them and various of our uh, original early copies had got lost or gone astray in all our house movings so uh, I bought I bought the, the Faber reprints but the chimneys of Green No was missing. And I spoke to Diana, Lucy Boston's daughter, and she told me that, very sadly and actually very ironically, Faber had decided not to reprint the chimneys of Green No because, and this beggars belief, because they thought it wasn't politically correct. Because in the story, the, the little uh, African boy, who's portrayed with great sympathy and um, we see things very much from his perspective and any child reading this would have any racial prejudice immediately taken away from them because they'd really identify with him. But the book reflects the way children were treated, uh, both disabled and, and racially different children were treated in English society in the 1890s, in 1790s. And so among other ways he's treated, the, the N-word is used uh, by the adults, but it's very much countered by the book. But somebody at Faber thought, oh, it's got the N-word in it, we can't print it. And as a result, they didn't reprint a book which was pioneering in its time in both making central and putting forward and advocating both the disabled and people from ethnic minorities. It's so ironic.
Anyway, I have the book now and I have this lovely letter. The lady who sent it to me was downsizing and she wanted the book to go to someone who would appreciate it. Well, I certainly do appreciate it. And um, it's hard to give you a taste of it, but let me just give you a little bit. This is where the modern child, uh, Tolly, who's now begun to empathise with and begin begun to see and to play with Susan and um, and Jacob, the two children from the late uh, 18th century. And he's thinking about what, it, he's here's the sighted child, the modern day sighted child, thinking about what it would have been like to have been blind. And instead of it all being, oh, terrible, um, he, his whole world is opened. And there's a, this passage is almost mystical, I think. Here he is with Mrs. Oldno, who really is Lucy Boston, uh, late at night before he goes to bed, opening the window and looking out on the spring night. Mrs. Oldno still came up every night to say good night to him for their mutual pleasure. She found him not yet in bed, but leaning out of the window in his pyjamas, looking at the first cherry blossoms showing whitish in the half dark and the evening star reflected in the river. He put his arm around her partridge waist. There are a lot of things Susan couldn't see, he said. She could smell, you know. Tolly took a great breath of the spring night. Do you think she could smell stars? I nearly can myself tonight. She could certainly smell the kind of thing that stars belong to and happen in. Sometimes you make things smaller by giving them a name to themselves, like star. Imagine Susan taking a breath of it and think just thinking all that. Tolly took a lungful of star and cherry blossom and fresh water river and you and sleeping violets then leapt into bed. I've been looking for Jacob in his closet but I only scared myself. I hope I don't have bad dreams. Why ever should you? I don't like being touched by things I can't see. Well, that's one disadvantage of having eyes. They make people afraid when they can't see. Everything that touched Susan was something she couldn't see. But far from being afraid, she wanted to catch everything in the act of being real. Isn't that brilliant? To catch everything in the act of being real. The moment of touching and smelling and sensing apprehension of the blind child is perhaps a closer touch on reality than the sighted person who divides them all up into these distinct things. She takes it all, all in. It's a wonderful story and I'm so thrilled to have this. I do commend the Lucy Boston books to you. Thanks for dropping by.